So this is an example of, so we're gonna go to the different characteristics of the neural network, but let's look at a couple neural networks. And in this example, I have two neural networks. You have your blue neural network, which I'm calling a, you know, the pleasant positive neural network. And then we have the red neural network that at this moment isn't running for this person. I'm gonna describe, you know, the person's a highly competent uh, business executive into marketing, um, operates within a stable corporation. The corporation is a really positive kind of work environment, is supportive, gives this person fl plenty of leeway to, to do their marketing, and everything's working really well. This person is a very happy person. Their emotion stuff connected to that blue system is good. They have good thoughts about their work and what they do. Just the go in and smelling the coffee and going in and seeing your friends and seeing the other people there, it all adds up to a positive experience for this person. And so that, that's a, a neural network um, that could be going for this, for this person. So each experience is its own pattern. So the, what makes the difference in what, in what we're experiencing is the pattern. And that pattern happens through the basic uh, wiring that develops genetically and through experiences over and over again. Some of the, oops, sorry. The neurons in each pattern are in many brain centers, so it's scattered all over the place. And so we have you know, uh, you know, emotional affect elements, we have vision elements, we have sensory elements, so, you know, we have you know, thoughts and ideas about it. So all those things go better, go together to form the network. Now we start to get to the interesting stuff. Each neuron is used in many patterns. Okay, so it's the pattern does not stand all by itself, but instead, in fact, there are connections between the neurons that are in the different patterns. Patterns sharing neurons can trigger each other. All right, so let's go, go to the pat, our diagram again. And so this, this one also shares emotion things here, has some smell things here, vision things here even shares some cognition, you know, there's cognition and some of them are shared and some of them are not in this network. And so let's talk about our executive and the market collapses and the market gets lower and what, get, what do they get rid of first? You know, marketing is a luxury, we're gonna get rid of our marketing person. So our marketing person is off on his own, uh, sets up his own company and is trying to find his own way you know, into making himself have a, a good experience and finds himself being tearful, finds himself being sad, feeling inadequate, feeling like he can't do anything. By the time he gets to me, he's figured out at least some of, the, of what's going on because what's happened is as, the, as he no longer has you know, the place that he goes and sees and, and has the thoughts of, oh, I like where I'm working because he's in a place where he doesn't like it that much, what happens is he starts to then trigger some of these neurons that are related to an old pattern. Okay, so his mom was bipolar and his mom was narcissistic and when he came home from school every day, he was clueless from zero to whenever what mom was gonna be doing. She might be three days sitting on the couch, not moving at all, so the kid had to come home and take care of himself and fix his own food and clean the house or she might be in a rage, and so the kid comes home and everything's his fault, even though he hadn't done anything different than the days before. And so he grew up with a general sense of helplessness and hopelessness. He coped by getting involved in the highly competitive kinds of you know, academic activities at school, and he developed in the structure of the school a, an ability to be competent, an ability to be very successful, and went and got the master's degree and went out into a workplace that was supportive and structured, and the networks were all the positive networks that were running. But when he started to get lost and started to be unsure, that was so similar to this old network that's lying down in there in his brain over and over in a very emotional and important kind of way, suddenly that's what he's feeling now. And, and the, the, the person said it really clearly. I know it was her, I know she was crazy, okay, but I can't change it. I still am doing this even though I know better. I know I'm a competent person but I'm still overrun by these feelings and feeling paralyzed and incompetent, so I must be crazy too. And what my neuroscience would say, what my network idea would say is, uh, you've stumbled into an old network and that old network disengages you from the competence 
that it's all still there. It didn't go away. Those networks still exist, okay? but she, that the person has lost touch with them. There, okay, so one way you can have a network that gets turned on is through those childhood kinds of experiences that happen over and over again. And that's one of the ways that in therapy we often see it. Um, but there are other ways to do it. Um, this is an example of a priming experiment. And so what they did here is they divided people into two groups. Um, you have the ones that have the highlight uh, that are thick, and then you have others that are tools that do active things. Um, and so these people learned these two different kinds of lists and then they were brought back in later and told to do either the same task or the task that the other group was doing. Okay, so one of the things they found when they were measuring the brain, watching it on EEGs, is if you trained on finding fat letters, okay, and then we asked you to find fat letters, Compared to the people who were trained to find tools, your fat letter system fired off faster than the people who had been trained to find tools. All right? And so their system, through training, became more easily and more rapidly turned on. All right? So that's hopeful in some ways for us. We can help people learn stuff, and we can actually help them develop networks that can do better. Um, but it's just an example of, when our brain gets set up and, and has experiences that lead it to do a specific thing, um, then, then it leads to things happening better no matter, what we, no matter what we want it to do. So we're back to the characteristics. Connections are through multiple pathways. All right, so Ledeau is a guy who has done a lot of research with um, fear and uh, looking at rats and, and how does the fear system work. And so what they did was they rang a bell and shocked the rat, okay? And pretty soon you have scared rats every time the bell rings, all right? And then what they did was they cut all the connections between the auditory system and the cortex, the auditory sensory input in the cortex. Well, if we were interviewing the rat, this is what it would be like. They ring the bell. The rat shouldn't, the rat, you say, did you hear anything? The rat can't hear anything, but what they observed is they ring the bell and the rat still goes like this. If we were interviewing the rat, rat, why are you going like this? I don't know, but something bad's gonna happen. Oh, well, maybe he's psychotic. Now, but the, and, but they, they were trying to figure out these connections and what they discovered was it, the connection comes in through your ear and then it goes to the thalamus, which is a little thing down in the bottom of your brain, and then it splits, okay? There's one that goes directly to your fear center, okay? And then there's another one that goes up to your cortex and then gets kicked up front and then it comes back down and that's the one that sort of figures out what's going on. Well, they cut out the part that could figure out what was going on, but the connection to fear was still there and it was happening, all right? Um, the message to me out of that is, what is the point of why? Why did you do that? All right. Well, I can tell you the part that got up to the cortex and got kicked up to the front, and I can explain that to somebody who's talking to me, but I'm explaining something that happened after the emotion happened or the reaction happened, which happens much faster. Okay? And so when I'm working with somebody about what's going on, I don't want them to tell me why, because often why is up there in the front of the brain, and now they're thinking why, and, and we have totally left that part down in the bottom of the brain, which is the real thing making them react, okay? And so I'm asking them, well, tell me what happened. What were you thinking before you did this behavior? I, I especially say this to assistant principals in school. You know, assistant principals in school are asking, why did you punch him? Well, it just seemed like a good idea. <laughs> yeah. That's not the answer the assistant principal will accept and then it'll get all over him. It's like, but the kid was gonna punch him because he's been hit by his dad 50 times and when that teacher got in his face, it was just like dad and he couldn't help it. It was just like, that's the only way he could defend himself from his dad. Did he think any of that stuff? He didn't think a bit of that stuff. It's just all of a sudden the feeling was there and how he did it because he'd been primed. He had rehearsed that network over and over again and it would have been great for him to describe to, uh, give that to the principal as the uh, reason he hit him. Uh, the, the deal is it's not gonna happen. 
why he tries to get the front of the head to explain a whole bunch of things that the front of the head doesn't even know happened. And so I don't want to be in the position of, of going that direction. The last part, down, the next to the last one down here is memory uses the parts of the brain that are used for encoding. Um, and so the example in, in a book, uh, Philip Cos I think it's Philip Cozzolino. So he had a great image of a guy sitting in, the old man sits, he's sitting in his chair and he's watching the boxing match. Now does the guy sit there and just sit there and watch the boxing match? The guy didn't sit there watching the boxing match. He's doing this. He's sort of squirming all around. Everybody gets hit. He's trying to, supposed to be ducking. He's supposed to do whatever. Why is he squirming around? He's squirming around because the representation, representation of experience uses the same systems in our brain that, that, um, that we use. Our, we, the representation of the experience come in uses the same systems in our brain that we would use if we were doing it. Okay? And when I see that right hook coming at me, I don't know if I more the flip, but if I see that right hook coming at me, I'm going to move my head like this. All right. And so in my brain, the brain sees it and the brain sort of twitches you this way. Um, and so initial perceptions use a certain part of your brain, the part of your brain as if you were doing it. When you trigger a memory, it uses those parts of the brain, same parts of the brain again. If you're doing imagery, let's do imagery of remaining calm when the teacher's yelling at you. All right, so that's going to use it. Um, when you're observing other people do it, all of these things rehearse these same systems and they all work together. Empathy does the same thing. I look at them, I think how much they feel, it must be terrible. What I'm doing is turning on the systems in my brain that, that I would be experiencing if I was in that situation. Those are neural networks, and those networks, so, so the, the part of the message is that when we do our interventions in therapy, if I am doing imagery of how to manage something, part of the value of that is it's similar to what happened to them before. They're doing it with a therapist now who's kind and caring, but they still are going through the experience of what it was like with dad. And then, and then as we go through those experiences, they can begin to make a shift because it's a little bit different, but it's a little bit the same. They can habituate. If you see something happen and then nothing bad happens, if you experience something that used to be bad and nothing bad happens over and over again, then your brain habituates. If we expose you to a snake and you have a snake phobia, but the snake's in the cage, you can get finally awfully close and not have anxiety anymore. Um, and so the, the habituation can happen from that kind of exposure. The last element with the neural networks is, and I'm going to, what I'll do is take a break for about 10 minutes in just a few minutes, so, um, is affect is special, all right? So in, in neural networks, af, uh, emotion helps us record memories, and then mo emotion also helps us connect memories. And so uh, in our neural networks, when neural networks share emotion, then they're likely to trigger each other. So, uh, and, and so uh, the, what science did back in the ancient days of psychological experimentation, he showed either sad or happy movies and then brought the people out and sat them down and said, did an interview and said, you know, tell us the earliest memory that you have of your life. And the people who had watched a sad, happy movie tended to see it, get us pull up a, a happy memory. The people who had watched a sad movie tended to pull up a sad memory. Um, because those were what was triggered. So affect is a way of interconnecting um, our ne neural networks. So, you know, neural networks is probably on your big picture sort of a patterns thing. It's happened over and over again. The, this is the way patterns are affecting how everything fits together. So let's go to uh, our example again. Remember Sammy, he was the kid that we decided, he, we didn't know, we didn't ever decide what it was wrong with him. Is it because he has um, you know, attention problems or verbal problems? Well, you know, what the evaluators finally figured out, you know, this kid cannot process oral language. All right, so they started 
you know, served him in school with a lot of extra pictures and they uh, had him have reading and, and extra cueing when he was going through things because he could use visual reading but he couldn't use the oral. And, and actually he started functioning very well, he turned into a calm kid and uh, things worked much better for him in school. But then he started middle school and all of a sudden he started avoiding school. All right, and, and so he just wouldn't come. He became agitated for the first few days. Um, he started stirring things up a little more and then he just quit coming. All right, so what's going on? Oh, we have a school phobic. So we'll get the psychologist and what the psychologist will come in and do is they'll do some relaxation training and maybe do some progressive approaching to the school and that'll help him get back into school and then we'll get back, Sammy back on the road. So, I'm a psychologist, but I've got my neuroscience thing going on. I said, well, why don't you tell me about going to school? What pops in your head when you think about going to school? Pops in your head is a way to get to neural networks. You know, it's like follow it around. And so he starts saying, well, okay, um, let's see. And, and I tell him, if it's stupid, you can still say it because networks put things together in stupid kinds of ways. If you've noticed your dreams lately, your networks put, kind, you know, put things together in funny ways. So he says, well, he thinks of a bear, and then he thinks of a cave, and I'm, okay, whatever, we don't know where he's going. Then he thinks of his Uncle Bill. Well, that's sort of odd, where'd that come from? And, and then he gets sort of nervous, and you can see him getting more nervous. I said, well, what's Uncle Bill look like? Well, I never liked him, and you know, he gives me toys, and he has a beard, and he smiles sort of ugly. Um, and what pops in your head when you think of school and you think of Uncle Bill? I'm totally, why are we at Uncle Bill? We're just doing relaxation to get you into school. Um, well, Mr. K, the principal, has a beard just like my Uncle Bill, right? And so, okay, well, that doesn't sound, you know, okay, so there's some kind of connection there. But then further exploration, you talk to the parents, well, who's Uncle Bill? Uncle Bill's the guy who's in jail, okay, for molesting kids, including Sammy, all right? And so we came in, I was just going to do this simple little, let's do the, you know, help him learn to relax, let's help him get back to school, all of a sudden we're in this mess. Right. And Mr. K is at school and he's got a beard just like Uncle Bill. All right. And so what's happened for Sammy is the, you know, he started having flashbacks and he started having reactions that are totally irrational. His friends tell him, Mr. K is a really cool guy. Okay. But that doesn't matter. He starts to see Mr. K and he starts to panic and freak out and so he's out of there again. All right. And so what we were doing is trying to follow the neural networks and we got there. We found something going on that was different than what we expected, but because we were willing to listen to the neural networks, we were able to get there. 